Anton Wilson. Wow, what a terrific introduction. After that, I guess I better make all of you popes. That's a religious uh, institution I have taken up lately. Every time I'm on television, I uh, make the whole audience listening uh, popes. And uh, then I started doing it over radio. We, st well, we started the Discordian Society back in the 60s. It was our ambition to make every man, woman, and child on the planet a pope. And uh, we printed... Hail Aries, all hail Discordia. Hail yes. Uh, hail yes. And uh, we started printing up Pope cards and handing them out. It gradually dawned on us it was going to take a long time to print up enough Pope cards and get all over the world, including Little America and Tibet and so on. So I think it's easier to just uh, appoint everybody who listens to me on radio or television or who comes to one of my entertainments. I don't call them lectures anymore because that sounds too dull and academic. Anybody who comes to my entertainments automatically becomes a pope. I will now do the official Discordian blessing. Spectacles, testicles, brandy, cigars. You're all popes. <laughs> Everybody in the audience is infallible. And the, your first duty as a Discordian pope is to excommunicate me. That's to keep up the old Discordian spirit that we Discordians must stick apart. And somebody was kind enough to leave me some wine. I, I like uh, I like people who put wine on the podium instead of playing over the water. I don't like the water. As W. C. Fields said, "Fish fuck in it." <laughs> uh, J. R. Bob Dodd says, "This is the secret of power." By the way, a lot of people have joined the Church of the Subgenius, seeking the secret of power, and they still haven't found it yet. I have been I've gotten a special dispensation from Bob to reveal it overtly at last. It's in all the subgenius literature, but it's always a little bit uh, covert or cryptic or hermetic. And Bob learned the secret of power from L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> in, an in an elevator in Palm Springs in 1957. You notice the world has been getting very steadily a little bit weirder every year since then. <laughs> the elevator got stuck between floors. And there was nobody on but L. Ron Hubbard and J.R. Bob Dobbs, who was then a humble aluminum siding salesman. And while they were stuck there and didn't know when they'd get out, Hubbard revealed the secret of power to Bob, and Bob went on and formed his own church and has millions of morons handing out subgenius literature on the street corners now. He's filthy rich, filthy, stinking rich, almost as rich as Hubbard. Almost as rich as Rajanish, almost as rich as the Pope, and Jimmy Swaggart. Now look, as for Jimmy Swaggart, so he liked to jack off while he was watching whores, big deal. But uh, he who has a hand free cast the first stone. <laughs> the, uh, the secret of power, which L. Ron Hubbard revealed to Bob, the secret is, you know how dumb the average guy is? Everybody knows that, right? You know how dumb the average guy is. Well, mathematically, by definition, half of them are even dumber than that. <laughs> now, now, you know, now you know how Rosh and Ish got 93 Rolls Royces. <laughs> That's how. The Head Revolution, H-E-A-D, Head. Uh, now I'm imitating Jesse Jackson. He likes to do speeches like that. The word for tonight is belief, B-E-L-I-E-F, belief. And the whole audience says, yeah, Jesse, belief. He says, that's it, belief. Okay, the word for tonight is head, H-E-A-D. You all know how to give head. The question is, can you use your head? Uh, it has been estimated recently, last year as a matter of fact, in Judith Humper's book, uh, The Three Pound Universe, with current state-of-the-art technology, the very latest in computers as of a year ago, which is out of date already, but anyway, up to a year ago, with that technology to build a computer that did everything the human brain does as efficiently as the human brain, it would have to be the size as big as the World Trade Center and as wide as the state of Texas. 
Or maybe it's uncool to mention Texas and Arizona. <laughs> I don't know. H E A D head. Uh, we are we are given these magnificent computers that uh, that can outperform anything on the on the planet uh, that's been done electronically so far. And then just to prove God has a sense of humor, we weren't given an instruction manual on how to use them. <laughs> and, and so you find people doing the weirdest things with their heads. Uh, when people are born, they are capable of learning any language. I have checked this out. I have been to France. I assure you, the little kids there speak French as well as the adults. <laughs> Incredible! They're very smart, very smart over there. Actually, the little kids in Africa are speaking Kikuyu as well as the adults are. Uh, you'll find in Hawaii, they're speaking Hawaiian as well as the adults. A child can learn any language, uh, master any symbolic skills, uh, well, as an example of what people can do, there are people who have actually grown up training themselves. They can actually play Beethoven's late piano sonatas. That's an absolutely incredible thing. I can hardly understand them. And some people can actually play them. Uh, there are people who can... Uh, there was a fellow who walked a tightrope over Niagara Falls once. I think his name was Bob Dean. Uh, there are people who can solve differential equations with uh, as easy as Superman leaping over a tall building. I solve differential equations at the rate of one an hour, if I could do it at all. Uh, absolutely, there uh, seems to be no limit. Uh, the human brain is capable of adopting any sex role imaginable, just look around. If you, if you want to know how far it can go, visit San Francisco. Uh, they got a group in San Francisco called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. They, they may have gotten one of those indulgences and played it over and over until they got perpetual indulgence, I don't know. That's a bunch of gay men who dress up as nuns. I don't know why. San Francisco is just like that. Uh, and yet most people, with this fantastically versatile brain that can do all these things, most people, if they're born in Dublin, Ireland, they grow up bigoted Irish Catholics. And anybody from outside Dublin can see that. My God, are they bigoted Irish Catholics. Wow. And the ones who grow up in Tehran are bigoted Muslim fundamentalists. And the ones who go to Oxford University come out bigoted agnostics, convinced of their superiority over all the rest of the world that hasn't been to Oxford and learned to be an agnostic. And uh, people who grow up in uh, Baptist families uh, that vote Republican in Ohio, they grow up to be bigoted Ohio Baptist Republicans. Uh, everybody takes this fantastically versatile brain and programs it to one static reality tunnel given to them by their parents and tries to make the whole world fit into that. And then you wonder why the world is in a mess. Uh, Rodney, Rodney Dangerfield says we're being governed by C students. Uh, but that's not it. The thing is, we're all wandering around with static, imprinted reality tunnels, and we very seldom even make an effort to revise them. And when we do make an effort to revise them, we generally find it's a great deal of trouble, so we give up and go back to our static reality tunnels. Uh, the uh, the world is growing a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more tolerant, a little bit more intelligent, just because the speed of communication has been increasing so tremendously. The speed of communication has, has increased one million fold, one million times since 1900. The speed of travel has increased a thousand fold since 1900. Nothing like this ever happened in history before. As an example, how many people in this audience have been in more than 10 countries? Hold up your hands, please. How many have been in more than five countries? Look around. Uh, most people grew up and uh, never left the farm where they were born. Throughout most of history, most people never got more than 20 miles from where they were born. Most mammals never get more than 20 miles from where they were born. The caribou migrate over thousands of miles. But the average field mouse or vole or beaver, the average mammal throughout history has never gone more than 20 miles from where it's born, and the average domesticated primate uh, hasn't gone more than 20 miles from where he, she, or it was born. Now we're traveling all over the world. Uh, most people have visited at least three countries in their lifetimes. I've been in about uh, 20 countries in the last year, and I'm, I'm not at all exceptional. I know people who travel a lot more than me. 
and we're getting signals from all over. I heard Buckminster Fuller say that by the 1980s it would be possible to feed the whole world and abolish starvation. And Fuller said, and by the 1980s this will be understood by the younger generation because television will accelerate the exchange of signals around the planet to such an extent that they will get a clear picture of what's going on in the world. And they will be so intelligent by the 1980s, they will not ask politicians to solve the problem of hunger. They will take the responsibility themselves to solve the problem. And I heard Fuller say that in 1954. By the middle of the 70s, there was the Hunger Project trying to alert everybody to the fact, hey, yes, we can abolish hunger in this generation. A few years ago, a Dublin man, uh, everybody, everybody in Dublin is really proud of Bob Gildorf because he's a Dublin man. A Dublin man managed to get all the major rock groups in the world together to do the Band-Aid and then later the Live Aid, which brought this message all over the world. Never before have so many people got the same signal at the same time, just through the incredible technology of television. Everybody in the world now knows it is possible to abolish hunger. Uh, everybody is doing what they can about it, except for those who prefer to sit down and bitch, well, why don't the politicians do it? Uh, which is a lot of wasted effort. The uh, Bob Geldof, uh, the movement of which Bob got Geldof is now the temporary figurehead, and I'm not taking anything away from him, but it did begin with Bucky Fuller and Wayne Earhart did a lot to spread it, and a lot of other people did a lot to spread it. Uh, this is a turning point in history. Never before have we had this capacity uh, to abolish hunger. Never before have we understood that we have the capacity, and never before have we had so much optimism that by God we can do it. Uh, and this is all created by the acceleration of communication, by the fact that images are traveling by satellite and television so fast that everybody knows what's going on in everybody else's backyard. People sit around Phoenix, Arizona, and worry about what's going on in, the, in South Africa. Uh, people sit around Dublin and worry about what's going on in uh, El Salvador. In Kerry, they have a six-foot-tall white rabbit called the puka. How many people here have heard of the puka? Ah, great. Puka is a six-foot-tall white rabbit who has command of time, even in Ireland where time doesn't exist. Uh, at 11.30, Irish pubs close. and uh, They uh, try to get the customers out. And by around 12.30, they've generally succeeded in getting the last customer out. And then the people start the hazardous process of trying to find their way home after 14 pints of Guinness, which is not the easiest thing in the world. I know, I've lived there long enough to have acquired the habit. And uh, if you happen to live in Kerry, uh, especially southern Kerry, uh, around Dingle Peninsula especially, you're, you're likely on your way home to encounter the six-foot-tall white rabbit who will jump out from behind a tree and shout, I've got your arse, mate! And the next thing you know, he drags you off into fairyland, and you go through the, all the kalpas of the Upanishads, and all, all, of, all of the myths of Babylon, the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the whole Star Wars trilogy, Finnegan's Wake, uh, the Brothers Grimm, uh, the whole collective unconscious, or the whole other world, whatever it is, fairyland, side, uh, maybe it's extraterrestrials, whatever it is, you go through all of that, millions of years pass, you go through thousands and thousands of incarnations, and when the puka is tired of playing with you and lets you loose, you're on the road a few minutes later in consensus time from the time when he grabbed you. When I first arrived in Ireland, I heard a, uh, an interviewer on RTE, Radio Telefiche Iran, uh, with uh, what I later came to recognize was the educated Dublin accent, Trinity College accent. And he was saying to this Kerry farmer who was telling stories about the puka as part of the oral history of Ireland that they're doing, he asked, do you yourself believe in the puka? And the Kerry farmer said, that I do not, and I doubt much that he believes in me either. <laughs> Which is uh, the great, the most, I think one of the greatest example of Kerry logic I've ever heard. Kerry juries are famous for their verdicts. Uh, jurisprudence in the, in the west of the English-speaking world will never achieve the heights that it has achieved in Kerry. There was one jury who voted not guilty if he promises to leave town. <laughs> another voted uh, not guilty if he doesn't do it again for another couple of weeks. Uh, in the case of a landlord found dead of 50 pistol shots, the verdict was the most aggravated case of suicide in our experience. <laughs>
<laughs> I had my own experience with the Puka once. Back in 1973, as some of you may know, I began receiving uh, telepathic communications from a higher intelligence in the system of the double star Sirius. Nobody wants to shoot me full of Thorazine right away? Uh, well, at least that's what it seemed like at the time. I, I was getting uh, very interesting uh, messages full of uh, very interesting information about human evolution and the direction we should go in. And I, I thought it was coming from the double star Sirius. When I tried to check where it was coming from, I got ambiguous answers. But they all seemed to have hints in it saying, yeah, we're from Sirius, but we don't want to make it too clear yet. You have to wait a while for the rev final stunning revelation. And uh, while this was going on, I got a psychic reading from a, a psychic who had the wonderful name Penny Looney. <laughs> I think every psychic should have Looney as a last name. If I ever turn professional psychic, I'll change my name to Robert Anton Looney. <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the leading uh, academic uh, proponents of the theory that Bacon wrote Shakespeare was also named Looney. It's a, it's a wonderful name for people with controversial causes. You might as well say it about yourself before your enemy says it about you. Uh, anyway, Penny Looney told me I was channeling an ancient Chinese philosopher. And I often look back, uh, lately, the last couple of years, I look back with regret. If I had taken that seriously and literally, if I had accepted that one narrow little reality tunnel to describe what was happening to me, I'd be on television now with Shirley MacLaine making, uh, <laughs> making fat bucks, you know? Channeling is really in these days. I, I've seen some of these uh, uh, entities that are being channeled, like Ramtha and Lazarus and Gonad the Barbarian. <laughs> I was willing to consider it as an alternative reality tunnel that I was channeling an ancient Chinese philosopher. A lot of my ideas seemed Taoist. Eisenhower was my favorite president <laughs> because he did nothing. Uh, as the Taoist philosophy, the ideal ruler does nothing. As flattering as it was to think that I was receiving communications from Sirius or channeling an ancient Chinese philosopher, I ran into another psychic reader who gave me a reading and informed me that I was channeling a medieval Irish poet. And I liked that because I'm bonkers about Irish poetry, so I went around for years telling people, oh yeah, I can channel an Irish poet anytime I want. Uh, but then uh, there's one side of me that remains incorrigibly a scientific uh, skeptic. And I always considered that very likely what was going on is that my right hemisphere and left hemisphere were communicating with each other. And the uh, right hemisphere data was so nonlinear and so incapable of fitting into a left hemisphere map that I had to invent extravagant metaphors to account for what was going on with me. And I think that's the most economical, parsimonious scientific model, so I believe it most of the time. Except when I think it was a six foot tall white rabbit from Kerry. I got that idea when I was looking at a movie called Harvey. Uh, Harvey is based on a Broadway play, uh, and it's about a, a typical Ohio uh, businessman uh, who's coming out of a bar one night, and he meets the six-foot-tall white rabbit from County Kerry, who happens to be named Harvey in this case. And Harvey says to him, good evening, Mr. Dowd. And he says, good evening, and who are you? A psychiatrist asked Elwood, weren't you astonished when that happened? And Elwood says, no, this is a small town. Everybody knows my name. <laughs> and uh, Elwood has a great friendship with this six foot tall white rabbit. And uh, I was watching this movie and I'm thinking, yeah, this is just like the relationship I have with the entity that communicates through me, uh, which may be my own right hemisphere, or it may be uh, an extraterrestrial, or it may be one of the allies that Don Juan says every sorcerer needs to have on his side, or it could be the holy guardian angel, the Kabbalists invoke. As a matter of fact, I first contacted it by doing a Kabbalistic invocation of the holy guardian angel. So it could be the holy guardian angel, it could be the right hemisphere of my brain, it could be an extraterrestrial, it could be an ancient Chinese philosopher, uh, but I prefer most of the time to think that it's a six foot tall white rabbit from County Kerry, because there's no chance of anybody taking that metaphor literally. The best scene in Harvey, the best scene for me, this is where my mania really flared to a fever pitch. 
a hot white light is when a skeptical psychiatric orderly looks up Puka in the dictionary. Now, his name happens to be Wilson, the orderly in the film. Now, he looks up Puka in the dictionary, and the definition is a Celtic elf or vegetation spirit, wise but mischievous, fond of rum pots, crack pots, and how are you tonight, Mr. Wilson? <laughs> I was watching that and I thought, my God, now he's talking to me through the television set. <laughs> I am illustrating the benefit of having more than one reality tunnel. Uh, Alistair Crowley used to urge his disciples to have a ring that fit equally well on two fingers. And when you have the ring on one finger, you're a uh, meat-eating conservative anti-Semite. Uh, that was permissible in Crowley's day. Uh, you take it off, put it on the other finger, you're a vegetarian pacifist who despises all forms of racism. And uh, during the day you change the ring and change your personality each time you change the ring. It's a fantastically illuminating exercise. You begin to learn what the head revolution means, hedonic engineering and development. A single ego is a, an incredibly narrow view from which to look at the universe. The more egos you have, until you find a way to get rid of an ego entirely, the more egos you have, the more views you can take. The more reality tunnels you look through, the more of the great big gestalt of the Rorschach inkblot of existence you can see. As long as you insist on looking at it from a scientific angle, you're only seeing part of it. You look at it from an artistic angle, you're only seeing part of it. If you want to look at it through Roman Catholic dogma, you're only seeing part of it. If you want to look at it through Marxist dogma, you're only seeing part of it. If you can keep jumping from one reality tunnel to another, you see more and more of it. As for example, how many of you have ever considered whether a woman should divorce her husband for sodomizing a camel? <laughs> That issue. That's, that's, a, that's a very important issue in Iran. Uh, the, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini has written a book, a commentary on the Koran. And as everybody in Iran knows now, uh, the Ayatollah has a direct pipeline to Allah and gets the straight word from Celestial Tier 666 in paradise up there and knows just what Allah has to say about everything. Everybody in Iran knows that, because all the people who didn't know it have been shot by now. <laughs> uh, that's one way of maintaining orthodoxy. Uh, the Ayatollah has written a commentary on uh, the Koran in which he handles all these delicate, uh, finicky little sexual questions that Catholic theologians are so good at also. And uh, he takes up the question, if a woman discovers that her husband is in the habit of sodomizing camels, does she have the right to divorce him? And Allah says no. Allah is against divorce in virtually all cases. The marriage uh, bond is practically unbreakable. Uh, this woman just has to learn to tolerate it. Uh, this guy may catch something worse than AIDS and give it to her, but still, the marriage contract is indissoluble, almost. Actually, the Ayatollah does have his liberal side. Later in the book, he takes up the question, if a woman finds out her husband is in the habit of sodomizing her brother, can she get a divorce? And the Ayatollah decides she can. That's even worse than sodomizing camels regularly. Uh, I, had an Islamic, uh, I had an Islamic theologian, Hakim Bey, at Brooklyn explain this to me. He said, well, you see, when you're sodomizing a camel, that's a dumb animal. I said, it's only a sin for you. When you're sodomizing your brother-in-law, he's a spiritual being too, so that makes two sins. Therefore, it's worse to sodomize your brother-in-law than to sodomize a camel. Uh, do, do these matters of Islamic theology deeply concern anybody here? Uh, but, but these are important issues in Iran. You can be killed for having the wrong opinion on these issues. On the other hand, the Pope says that marriage is absolutely indissoluble. A Catholic woman cannot get a divorce if her husband gets drunk every night, comes home and sexually abuses their children, beats her up continually, uh, gives her syphilis and then goes out and sodomizes her brother and a camel in the backyard, the same thing. Uh, to, the, to the Catholic Church, no divorce means no divorce. They're Aristotelians. You see, the Ayatollah is comparatively speaking a liberal. <laughs> we all have our own reality.
reality tunnels through which we look at things. And those of you who think uh, the uh, the puka is peculiarly Irish, despite the fact that it managed to star in a very successful American movie, J. Allen Hynek of the Center for UFO Studies has a case of a UFO landing that he investigated and all around the burn marks on the ground. He found hundreds and hundreds of paralyzed rabbits. There's a farmer in Isola, Italy, who claims that a UFO landed in his backyard and took all the rabbits out of his rabbit hutch, put them in the, put them aboard the UFO and took off again. Uh, this, uh, this is part of the an amazing new science of wet poofology, uh, the study of the relationship between rabbits and UFOs. Uh, there, are only, there are only two rulers in the whole history of the world who, have, who were UFO uh, witnesses and were also attacked by killer rabbits. There was uh, King Arthur, in the Monty Python film, the Monty Python and all the uh, King Arthur sees a UFO about halfway through the movie and a little bit later he encounters this killer rabbit. You may remember John Cleese's immortal line, that rodent has a mean streak a mile wide. <laughs> it was a genuine killer rabbit. And uh, the other great ruler of a great nation who was a UFO witness was Jimmy Carter, who saw a UFO in Plains, Georgia. And a couple of years later, he was attacked by a killer rabbit. Remember that? That was in uh, uh, 1979. Uh, then there's a UFO uh, contact story I read recently where the contactee says the pilot of the UFO looked like a giant rabbit. Uh, these are things we may never get to the bottom of in our time. Uh, Every animal begins with a bio-survival system, uh, an oral bio-survival system. You know what uh, this carpet tastes like? Uh, you know what my shoe tastes like? Uh, you know what the edge of this tastes like, right? Thank you, you all know. That's because you started out with no, no mind but an oral bio-survival system and you try to judge the world by tasting everything. In those days, mommy was a portable food supply. She didn't even have a personality yet. That was just where the food came from. Remember? That's, that's, the, that's the oral bio-survival system which underlays all of our consciousness. That's the first imprint. Uh, a goose, no, uh, we're born with a hardwired circuit to recognize uh, the mother archetype. Uh, a goose goes to the first two-legged thing it sees after it comes out of the egg. If it doesn't see the mother, it imprints something else. Well, we all imprint some kind of uh, mother image, and we all have a very active oral bio-survival circuit, which is why most people have a weight problem. We tend to deal with our anxieties by putting more food in. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a very prim primordial level of consciousness. Uh, after we get a little bit older and stand up and learn to walk, we develop into a mammalian level of consciousness and we start struggling for territory. Anybody who's ever had children knows what I'm talking about. There comes a period where the basic issue in the house at all hours of the day and night, they don't stop in the night, children are active 24 hours. The basic issue is who's in charge around here? And the toddler is trying to prove that they are in charge, the other siblings are not in charge, the parents are not in charge, the landlord is not in charge, the police are not in charge, they are in charge. And this struggle goes on for a month or a year or two years, and in the course of that, a whole anal territorial circuit is imprinted, which recapitulates the whole of mammalian evolution. Uh, all mammals mark their territories with excretions, you know that. That's pretty well known now since Lorenz got the Nobel for his studies of air. All mammals mark their territories with excretions. Uh, domesticated primates mark their territories with ink excretions on paper. <laughs> Every national border in the world represents a place where two gangs of domesticated primates fought until they were exhausted and then made an ink excretion. Uh, the, the whole history of war is summed up at Waterloo when the French were clearly defeated and uh, Wellington sent an emissary over to the French side to say you were fought gallantly, you have nothing to be ashamed of, surrender now so there will be no further slaughter. And General Cambron answered with the unforgettable word known in France as the word of Cambron, the mot de Cambron, and that word was MERDE! 
everybody who ever studied Napoleonic Wars knows that incident. That's because mainality and territory are so deeply connected with our whole mammalian heritage. So after we've got an oral biosurvival circuit and an anal territorial circuit, we are perfectly normal mammals and ready to take our place in a mammalian pack, which is what most of us do. Along uh, a little bit later, the DNA master tapes and RNA messenger molecules throughout the body and we mutate to the level where we can begin to understand symbol systems, which is why even the little kids in France can speak French, as I was saying before. We can master any symbol system. We can learn to play chess. We can learn to play Beethoven on the piano. And uh, the symbolic circuit is the peculiarly human circuit, the semantic circuit. The peculiar thing is with the semantic circuit, we can make a fantastic map of the universe. We can revise it. The semantic circuit seems to be connected with right-handedness. With the larynx, we make symbols that we communicate to others. With the right hand, we manipulate the world, and we make maps that way. And as we manipulate the world, we can revise our maps. The most astounding feature of humanity is that we so seldom revise our maps. We take the first map we were given, and if the universe doesn't fit it, we start forgetting parts of the universe. Uh, according to Marxism, the state should wither away six months after the revolution. Everybody in the Soviet Union has managed to forget that part of Marxism. According to the Catholic Church, the Pope is infallible. Uh, they've managed to forget all the popes who were uh, put on trial for heresy by the Council of Cardinals. Uh, everybody has a fantastic capacity to forget what doesn't fit their reality. Now. Charles Ford collected 900 paces of frogs falling out of the sky just because that doesn't fit anybody's reality. Time. And what he's trying to illustrate that we should try to get outside of our reality. Time. So he's known as a crank. Nobody is pro nobody is has brought with any evidence that these weren't reliable stories and frogs continue to fall out of the sky. They fell out of the sky in Russia three years ago, in Turkey a couple of years ago, in London just last year. Frogs fall out of the sky all the time. Nobody knows why. And uh, most people manage to forget it because it doesn't fit into any convenient reality tunnel. Uh, I think I'd like to say a few words in defense of stupidity. Uh, I've been accused of making fun of the stupid, which, uh, which it would be really cruel because uh, well, we should always be kind to the handicapped, especially if they're in the White House. Uh, but uh, I would like to say something in defense of stupidity. It wouldn't, there wouldn't be so much of it around if it wasn't serving a definite evolutionary function. Uh, what is the function of stupidity? The function of stupidity is to force the intelligent to get more intelligent. You have to get more intelligent in order to survive in a stupid world. And uh, the stupid, uh, and uh, in the Middle Ages, they started the Inquisition in, uh, in Southern Europe, and it drove all the intellectuals into Northern Europe. And that's why 500 years later, Northern Europe is still richer than Southern Europe, because all of the brains were driven out of Southern Europe. Uh, the stupidest thing in my lifetime was when the government made uh, research on psychedelic drugs illegal in 1966. That did not stop research, it just stopped people from writing scientific reports, comparing notes, correcting each other's work, and doing the general time binding that goes on in the scientific community when people can learn from one another. So now we're back in the dark ages with scholars passing their notebooks to one another under the table and saying, for God's sake, don't copy this, just like the old Inquisition. And uh, that, is, that has proven a tremendous benefit to modern America, that act of stupidity. It has forced all of the intelligent to get more intelligent. And that is to say, when people couldn't do psychedelic research anymore, they invented whole new ways of studying the brain. John Lilly invented his float tank. And if you go into a Lilly float tank for a couple of hours, you come out, and for the next few days, you're seeing new things, and you're not hallucinating. You're just seeing with greater clarity. Apparently, what's happening is the flow tank uh, causes the brain to release a lot of neuropeptides, especially endorphins, and endorphins uh, make it possible to create new networks in the brain, so you're able to perceive in new ways. And some people, there are, is there a place in Phoenix where you can rent a float these days? We used to like that. Hmm? A place in Flagstaff. Yeah, almost everywhere you go, there are places that have float tanks for rent now. All the businessmen are using them. 
A lot of business might have found you go float for an hour on Monday and you're more creative for the whole week. And we wouldn't have discovered that if the government hadn't take, taken Dr. Lilly's acid away from him. I thought it was a crime. I thought, gee, why do I want to take away Lilly's acid? He was doing so much good with it. But he, he developed the whole float tank out of that. Stanislas Graf, he was doing a lot of very important research with LSD in Czechoslovakia. I mean, he didn't like the communist government there which was interfering with scientific freedom. So he thought he'd come over to the United States, the land of the free, the home of the brave, where the government leaves science alone. And he went over there and they banned LSD research. Uh, he didn't want to go back to Czechoslovakia, so he started researching the yoga breathing techniques. And he's developed a whole new post reiki and post-yoga technique for changing consciousness by deep breathing and loud music, which he's teaching at Essel, and it's absolutely sensational. He probably never would have done that research if the government hadn't, hadn't driven him out of acid research. You see, stupidity is an evolutionary driver. It pushes you to the next stage of evolution. A lot of people driven out of psychedelic research went into biofeedback. And we've got a whole variety of fascinating biofeedback machines in the last 20 years. And biofeedback, I was recently told, is now the second most widely prescribed treatment for high blood pressure, hypertension. Biofeedback wouldn't have been investigated in such, uh, in, in such a way as it was if we didn't have the big iron curtain down on drug research. And uh, now biofeedback has given birth to a whole new generation of mind machines. Uh, fantastic things are now possible with instruments like the Pulsar or the uh, Endomax. You, you can dial the level of consciousness you want to go to as easily as dialing a television set. And uh, what I've been saying for the last 20 years, uh, the head revolution, we should learn to program our brains as well as we program our computers. We do have the technology now to do it. We're learning more all the time. The Brain Mind Bulletin estimated in the last issue, we have learned more about the brain in the last 25 years than in all previous history. The thing that fascinates me about the current generation of brain hardware and software uh, which uh, there's a lot of interesting software too. Uh, there's Leary's Mind Bearer game in which you learn which games you continually play in your social relations and you get expert coaching on how to play better games to be more successful. There's a great set of software called Breakthrough which goes with the word processing program and uh, that opens little boxes subliminally and they ask unsolved questions in science and philosophy or 70% of them do. The other windows that you don't see give you positive suggestions. I can be more creative than I've ever been before. There are no limits to my thinking. I can think the unthinkable. I can solve the unsolvable. And you can't resist the positive suggestion because you never see it consciously. It's as slick as hypnosis. It goes right into the unconscious. So being asked these basic questions in philosophy and science with the suggestion that you can solve them, well, people using that software are very happy and creative people. Uh, just like people playing Tim, uh, Tim Leary's uh, Mind Mirror game. Uh, my belief is that the human race has been stupid, miserable, angry, frustrated, and mean to one another for so long because people don't know how to use their brains. Well, why be sad when you can be happy? Why be angry when you can solve your problems? Why be depressed when you can be creative? The only reason people are on down trips is they don't know how to program their brains properly. They think, gee, if I just used a little more willpower. But willpower is a mystical, meaningless concept. Nobody knows where it is, what it is, or how to turn it off or on. We are beginning to learn how to change our brain chemistry, how to change the cycles, the rhythms of the brain. We're learning how to provoke the brain to greater creativity. We are the first generation in history that well, we no longer has to be the conditioned rabbit in the behaviorist cage. We can be the programmer of our own computers. And now we will take a break while you look at the machines, and then we'll come back and have a question and answer period. Because I use them after the uh, 
a deadpan uh, light bulb. Uh, what you must probably have on my writings? Well, considerable, but he's only one of many influences. Uh, James Joyce is a powerful influence. H.L. Mencken, Timothy Leary, Ezra Pound, Benjamin Tucker, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Shakespeare, Dante, Homer, uh, Raymond Chandler, Elephant Duty comics. Uh, this, uh, I think I've been influenced by every every moment I've been awake since birth, and I think I've been influenced a lot of the time when I was asleep too. Uh, but uh, Pro Crowley is definitely an influence. Uh, his style, his way of putting a dozen different meanings into a sentence intrigues me, and I often make uh, similar efforts. And I quite frequently have the delightful experience of discovering readers who have actually found the double and triple meanings. Nothing warms a writer's heart more than that. Yes? I guess uh, the difficulty that I have with your writings that uh, I'm sure was intentional is, is I have, have uh, trouble determining when you, you're, you're tongue in cheek and when, you, when you're being serious. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, do you really believe uh, half of what you write? Well, uh, that's a very easy answer. When am I, when am I uh, kidding and when am I serious? Uh, it's very obvious. Uh, I'm always kidding. I'm never serious. <laughs> of course, as Bernard Shaw said, uh, I, am, I am most serious when I'm joking. I hope that clarifies the matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's, sort of like the, uh, it's sort of like the monk who said to the Zen master, what happens after death? And the Zen master said, I don't know. And the monk said, but you're a Zen master. And he said, yes, but I'm not a dead Zen master. <laughs> yes. Um, it sounds like human emotions get in the way of higher intelligence. Would you agree or disagree with that? Uh, the human emotions get in the way of higher intelligence. Uh, that depends on the, uh, the degree of robotry in the emotions. Uh, there, are, there are mechanical emotions and free emotions. Uh, intelligence itself gets in the way of higher intelligence. Robotic intelligence blocks higher intelligence as much as robotic emotions do. Uh, the evolution to higher intelligence means an evolution to greater and greater freedom, greater and greater ability to shift your neurological programs to get out of one reality tunnel into another reality tunnel. And to the extent that people are trapped in robotic emotions like self-pity or anger or rage or other negative emotions, that interferes with higher intelligence. But to the extent that they're trapped in a rigid intellectual grid, like I will explain everything in terms of the basic propositions of Das Kapital, or I will explain everything in terms of the basic ideas of Ayn Rand, or I will make everything fit the Pope's latest encyclical, that you can have a very high level of intelligence. There are brilliant Jesuits, there are brilliant Marxists, there are, are there some brilliant disciples of Ayn Rand? Uh, there must be. Uh, I, just, I just haven't met any of them. Uh, but, but that kind of rigid intellectuality interferes with higher intelligence as much as rigid emotions do. It's not emotions versus intellect, it's rigidity versus creativity is the major parameter that I'm concerned with. Yes? I have to try. I'm, reading, I'm reading the Tao of Physics right now, and it's, it talks about the two different aspects of the same reality, which is good and evil or the opposites. Do you see the human race going to a state of uh, where the good overcomes evil, or do you think all those two things will always exist? Wow. Well, this is a question for a philosopher. Is good going to come evil, uh, overcome evil, or are both of them going to cease to exist? I really you see, you feel that these two things are existing. Well, good, good, good and evil are, are categories that I find uh, kind of fruitless to deal with. I, I will answer you with a parable. I don't know where this parable comes from. I had a, my memory is that I dreamed this. But somebody told me it was in an, an underground comic about 20 years ago, so maybe I didn't dream it. Maybe somebody told it to me. But the parable is two little blades of grass were talking, and one says, I don't believe in God anymore because there's so much evil in the universe. And the other blade of grass says, what do you mean by evil? And the first blade of grass says, well, look at these goddamn cows. They're always coming around chewing us, cutting our lives short for no good reason but to fill their fat bellies. Now, why would a good God create those rotten cows? 
And while the other blade of grass was pondering that deep theological question, a cow came along and ate both of them. And the cow wandered off and said to another cow, this cow was a philosophical bovine. And this cow said, you know, I'm beginning to have doubts about the existence of God. And the other cow said, why? And the first cow said, well, why would a good God create tigers? You know, Bossy was eaten by a tiger just last week, and it happens every month or so, one of us gets eaten by tigers. Why would a good God do that? I'm very skeptical about God. And a tiger came over the hill and ate both of them. And the tiger went home and joined the other tigers and said, you know, I'm beginning to have doubts about the existence of God. And the other tiger said, why? And the first tiger said, well, why would a good God create men with guns who come and shoot tigers? And uh, uh, that, uh, that is the, I think evil is a very narrow perspective based on an egocentric view of the situation. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Now, the number of patents granted every year is an exponential function, for instance. The, every year there are more patents than the year before, and it keeps rising like a skyrocket. Uh, scientific knowledge is doubling faster all the time. But it took from the time of Christ to the time of Leonardo for the knowledge to double once. Uh, it's, it's doubled several times in the last decade. And Fuller, projecting all those things forward, concluded that between 1989 and 2000, we were going to uh, reach the point where the, the explosive power on the planet will either be used, it will blow the whole show, that's Oblivion in his famous uh, uh, scenario, Utopia or Oblivion, or we will use this tremendous power to uh, make the, the living conditions of everybody on the Earth so much higher than they've ever been in past history that it will outperform any utopia, any science fiction writer ever dreamed. And Fuller bases this, as I say, on really hard uh, mathematical data of trajectories. And that's very much like what these occultists are coming out to, a total transformation of the planet. So while I'm not at all convinced that you can reason this out from the E. Jing or the Mayan calendar, I agree with people like Jose Acrelis and uh, Dekena that we are living in the most revolutionary period since the life appeared on this planet. And I find it an exhilarating time to be alive. It doesn't frighten me at all. I think the good possibilities are much greater than the bad possibilities. Also, I think worrying is a bad habit. Uh, I think people, some people are addicted to worrying. There are some people who would worry if you told them, hey, you know, it's Tuesday. Oh, Jesus Christ, it's Tuesday all <laughs> over. Uh, worrying is a bad habit. It accomplishes nothing, and it probably will give you ulcers. Yes? Can you comment on what you know about lucid dreaming and how you think it relates to the uh, HEAD? Uh, lucid dreaming and how it relates to the head revolution. Uh, lucid dreaming is a skill well worth developing. Uh, what else have I got to say about lucid dreaming? The, fascinating thing about, the most fascinating thing about lucid dreaming is the better I get at it, the more I realize that Joyce was portraying the unconscious accurately in Finnegan's Wake. Uh, it's only when you're in the, the real fogged over dream state, you think you can tell your dream simply in simple words by saying, well, I was on the New York subway and I saw somebody with a knife. Uh, when you get into lucid dreaming, you realize you're on the New York subway and you're also in a nightclub in Chicago and you're also climbing a mountain in, in Tibet which is just the way Joyce writes in Finnegan's Wake. The unconscious, is, can, the unconscious can handle several reality tunnels at once. It's only our conscious minds that are narrowed down to what Blake called uh, single vision and Newton sleep. Uh, and learning to explore the multiple reality tunnels that are available in lucid dreaming probably frees up as much uh, neurological energy and new uh, creative potentials as any of these machines are 10 years doing yoga. Uh, the whole Western art cult tradition has always uh, put a big emphasis on learning how to do lucid dreaming. And it is, a, it is a very valuable art to learn. I think some of my happiest hours are spent in lucid dreaming. 
Yes. Finnegan's Wake has aided you in lucid dreaming? Yeah, very definitely. Finnegan's Wake is the best guide for lucid dreaming. If you read Finnegan's Wake enough, you get into lucid dreaming almost without trying. The way Joyce wrote Finnegan's Wake, he would get up in the morning and jot down his dreams, and then he would work all day at inventing a language complicated enough to describe the multiple reality tunnels of the dream. And by then, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere were working in synchrony with each other. The left hemisphere trying to get this into uh, uh, a more or less linear book, although Finnegan's Wake is the least linear book ever written. It's basically a big circle. And uh, the right uh, hemisphere saying, you got it right, or no, you didn't get it right yet, try again. And then Joyce would go to sleep at night and dream some more lucid dreams and get up in the morning and record them. And so he had uh, the conscious and the unconscious, the right and the left hemispheres working together all the years he was on that book. And so, of course, his life became an absolute symphony of synchronicities. Do you find most useful in that school of thought? seems like the multiple eyes comes into your writing quite a bit. Oh, the multiple ego. There is no one ego. The idea that uh, most human behavior is fairly robotic. I learned that when I was in college from the behaviorists, and I rejected it after a while as I got more and more heavily influenced by Jung and Leary and Sullivan and the whole human potential side of psychology. Uh, but I, kept, I was continually haunted by the fact, all of this human potential stuff, I like it, it seems to work, but aren't we moving from one level of robotry to a higher level of robotic reaction? I don't know, maybe aren't the behavior is partly right? And uh, Gary Chief came as a great relief to me in uh, explaining we all start out as robots, but we can keep reprogramming ourselves till we get to the level where we're not completely robots anymore. And uh, that, I think, is the most hopeful thing any psychologist can say with the state of our knowledge the way it is now. Uh, Tim Leary said in a recent interview, I think I'm about 99.9999% worldwide, but I'm very grateful I've achieved that 0.0001% freedom. And I, I, that's very similar to what I call the cosmic schmuck principle, which is uh, that uh, when, when I was around 40, I suddenly noticed I'd been a cosmic schmuck up until I was about 35. And I thought, well, thank God I've recovered from that. And then when I was 50, I discovered, my God, I was still a cosmic schmuck through most of my 40s. And now I'm in my mid-50s and I'm beginning to look back and I realize, my God, I was still pretty much of a schmuck when I was 50. And uh, I think if you, if you've achieved, if you've at least reached that level where you can see that you were a schmuck a few years ago, you're, in, you're in close to getting to the state where you can see that you were a schmuck yesterday. Yeah. And when you get to that point, you can occasionally catch your schmuckiness before it takes over and wrecks everything, and it's bad. Uh, people who never realize that they're schmucks are the people who remain schmucks forever. That's very similar to Gurdjieff, uh, you recognize, that's very similar to Gurdjieff's distinction between the objectively hopeless idiot and the subjectively hopeless idiot. <laughs> Do you know how many Freemasons it takes to change a light bulb? <laughs> that's a craft secret. <laughs> Do you know how many Californians it takes to screw in a light bulb? Right! <laughs> Do you know how many Zen masters it takes to change a light bulb? No, they sit around and wait for the light bulb to change itself. No, two. One to change it and one not to change it. <laughs> I am supposed to, before I go off this evening, I'm supposed to remind you take your money to, 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 de to demonstrate to you that you've been misusing your brains all your life and to give you a few clues as to how to use the brain for fun and profit. The it's, uh, advanced work in the head revolution and those who haven't had at least 125 acid trips may not be quite ready for it yet. But, uh, however, we will take you in anyway and we will treat you with uh, grandmotherly kindness and try to bring you along as fast as you can possibly be moved. Uh, no, seriously, it's a, it's a, it's a seminar on uh, perception and uh, cognition and how to improve your capacities for both accurate perception and cognition without the usual forms of self-deception that are so epidemic on this primitive planet at this barbaric stage of evolution. And I'm getting tired, so that's all tonight. Thank Praise you. God! Praise God.